Good evening, friends. It's been too long since I've done one of these featured vlogs, and I wanted to catch up. I've been very busy the past month. I've been covering a wide range of topics, especially artificial intelligence and changes to the university. But tonight, I'd like to talk about a kind of chestnut of futures thinking, uh, an old idea, one that we keep coming back to, and it's one that's come up in my world quite a few times the past couple of weeks, so I'd, I'd like to address it. And this topic is life extension. And normally when I think about the future, I, I think about a wide range of views of individual ideas. I try to have a balance of everything from utopia to dystopia, trying to show all kinds of possibilities. But tonight, I, I'd like to focus on the challenges of life extension. I, I'd like to bring out the grim side. And the reason for this is because my recent encounters have all been very positive. That is, uh, a friend of mine uh, wrote a, a thoughtful substack trying to figure out why some people would not want life extension. For him, he thought it was obvious everyone would want this. And then I participated in an online session, a kind of panel slash workshop about life extension, and it was it was overwhelmingly positive. It was all about what a great thing this would be and how happy we should be about it. And uh, they even had a DJ playing music to try and get us in the spirit. And this really brought out my, my dark side. So I, I, I wanted to share some of those darker thoughts just to try to establish some balance and also to dig a little deeper into the subject. So. When we're talking about life extension, we're not talking about transference of consciousness to a machine. Uh, we're talking instead about various biological and uh, perhaps psychological changes that can help humans live a lot longer. Now, historically, we've just lived through 200 years of actual life extension. If you compare mortality rates from, say, the 1700s to the past 30 years, humans are living a lot longer, generally speaking. I mean, COVID took the mark our age down a couple of years because COVID really afflicted the elderly. Uh, and of course, this varies from nation to nation, economic, socioeconomic status to socioeconomic status. Uh, and of course, all kinds of individual figures, individual facets play a role in this, thinking about lifestyle choices as well as pure luck, not to mention access to healthcare and public health. But generally speaking, the past 200 years, roughly, we've seen a big push forward in life extension. So the idea goes now, why why don't we go further still? Perhaps, you know, if, if 70s are the ages that we get, then we're accustomed to people living in their 80s and 90s. Perhaps we should push for 110, 120. Perhaps, you know, 95 will be the next 55. And there are all kinds of projects and efforts trying to struggle with this. And it's obvious to see some of the appeal. I mean, it's, it, I think asking many people, people would say, yes, I'd love to live longer. Uh, there's a lot more I'd like to do, more I'd like to experience, more time I'd like to spend doing certain things in life. And you can find traces of this going back in all kinds of cultures, arguably all the way back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, where our nominal hero, our titular hero, tries to uh, attain the secret for life everlasting and just misses it. Uh, but I, I, I think we need to take into account some of the problems. Uh, as a science fiction writer once observed, it's not that hard to predict the automobile. What's harder is to anticipate traffic jams. So tonight I'd like to share some of those traffic jams. Uh, the first one is not a new objection. I think this is one that humans have dealt with forever, uh, as long as we've been humans. And that's the question of quality of life. Yes, I may live longer. Uh, I may have more years to experience, but if my mind and or body begin to decay and reduce the quality of that time, is this something I'd really like to have? And we've experienced this over the past couple of generations where we've seen older and older people getting to experience all kinds of downsides, thinking about cognitive problems, Alzheimer's, as well as all kinds of biological challenges. My own father passed last year and the last decade of his life, he was his life was prolonged through all kinds of heroic medical interventions and his quality of life sank uh, step by step uh, really really steeply and it was, it's an interesting question if the last few years of his life were actually um, a decent quality of life to justify being alive 
Um, this is an older problem, but we have to think about this now. If we are hypothetically imagining life going to year 110 or to 120 years of age, what kind of life is that? And I, th I think most people who are life extension advocates will say, yes, we know this. Um, but I think they are assuming continued and massive improvements in healthcare, along with public health. Uh, so the, the heroic me measures that kept my father alive that I mentioned were didn't exist 10 or 20 years previously. So we should expect more of that, you know, cures for Alzheimer's, ways to retard cancer and uh, painkillers that aren't addictive and so on. Uh, so I think that's a big assumption uh, and one that has to be out in the open. There's a second problem um, thinking about life extension and which is how do we actually structure this in the world? Uh, we know that, generally speaking, across the world, healthcare provision is, to put it mildly, uneven. Uh, yes, some nations are better than others at actually trying to have a rough equality of access to healthcare. Some, like my own United States, are, are very, very uneven. And we can also think about differences between, say, a G7 nation and a developing nation. Uh, my point here is I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that life extension technologies, modifications, whatever they turn out to be, will roll out unevenly. That is, the 1%, either locally or globally, will have first access. The best connected, the wealthiest, perhaps the most educated, will have access to that. Uh, I mean, in the United States, we already have, depending on your statistics, uh, a gap in lifespan based on socioeconomic status. Uh, those at the very top of the pyramid tend to live a few more years longer than those at the very bottom. Uh, how happy would we be, you know, to see a millionaire at 130 strolling happily through Manhattan while the people around them are expiring at, you know, at 70? Uh, is that something that is A, just, if we think about it ethically and philosophically, and B, is it something that we would accept politically, socially, or culturally? That's a, a different problem to think about. And then a third, let's just say, let's just say that we somehow meet those previous two objections I raised, that we do enjoy and drive forward massive public health and health care achievements, and that we are able to power through a greater chance of good quality of life for living beyond 100. And let's just say that we roll this out with some degree of of evenness, uh, at least not a degree that inspires violent global revolution. Uh, so if if we manage to do that, those are big ifs, but then we also have to anticipate other problems and challenges that come with it. I think, for example, if we manage to expand our population of over 65, over 70, over 100, and if those people are healthy or healthier than they normally would be, then do they continue working? Do they continue occupying powerful positions in public and private life? Do they represent a blockage to the advancement of the young? Uh, do people in their teens, 20s, and 30s now have to delay their advancement, their progress, their achievements as a result? This is a recipe for increased intergenerational tension, at the very least. And perhaps that might change as well what happens and what comes out of that society. Now, another thing to think about is, can the world actually support all this life extension? And I, I have a few ways of thinking about this. I mean, one is that we already are experiencing in countries that have gone through the demographic transition, that's a demographic transition whereby uh, society produces fewer and fewer children and lives longer and longer. And we're already starting to experience this problem of how do the working age people support the growing non-working age population? You know, the, that is a population that's growing that costs more in terms of pensions, in terms of public care, in terms of health care, in terms of public services and so on. How do you actually fund this? And this is not a solved problem. So what happens if we experience this? this at a much higher pitch if we have more and more people living uh, beyond retirement age. Further, I, I'm not sure if the, if the world would support this uh, in terms of civilization and climate change. That is, if the rollout is as uneven as I think it might be, and it tends to be the global 1% who get to live longer. That's the same population that is by far disproportionately responsible for carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So 
will that population live longer and fly more private jets and more uh, and more uh, air transport will they be you know buying more cars that are fossil fuel burnings will they be eating more meat and so on and so on so will they exacerbate climate change and then you have to think is there actually a climate argument against life extension I mean, that's the kind of very large scale ethical political cultural dimension we have to be thinking about and beyond that we also have to think about the fact that civilization might not be able to support this in other ways depending on what you anticipate for the next couple of generations if for example climate change hits us and hits us hard and leads to a degradation in quality of life or if other if we cross other planetary boundaries ocean acidification for example and we see enormous pressures placed on global food systems if our economic productivity doesn't take off if we deal with more disasters be they nuclear war biological war or pandemics that we handle badly as we, as we've already seen with covid is it possible that our civilization just might not be able to support our current population and our overall quality of life begins to step back how does that treat those who would live longer and longer and live well uh, one more dark side of this I'd like to bring up it, it seems kind of intuitive that everyone would want to live more you know that you'd want to if you're an athlete that you'd like to keep playing if you're a musician that you'd like to keep playing if you're uh, if you're a painter to keep painting and so on um, you know we all have loved ones that we'd love to see more of and and we resist mightily ending all of that but I think it's also true that some people greet longevity with concern or dread uh, I asked my students about this informally and some of them immediately said they did not want to live longer because they didn't want to be a burden on other people that, that was their immediate response they had clearly thought this through before and I wonder how many think that now for various reasons um, would marginalized populations tend to have this uh, line of thought would uh, women who are traditionally cast as caregivers but also as people who sacrifice for everyone else would they be more likely to have this Would certain religions or ideologies be more likely to press that uh, would a culture that embraces uh, dignified death and suicide also be more skeptical of living uh, longer and for how many people do they expect that quality of life after a certain age will decline so much that it won't be worth it um, I think quite a few of us have experienced loved ones people that we know closely who have decayed and suffered and we don't want to go that far so my point is I, I personally I would love to live forever uh, there's so much for me to read so much for me to learn so much for me to write so much for me to make there's so many people I want to I want to know uh, so many places I want to travel to so much food I want to make and my family and my loved ones who I want to spend as much time as possible with I think a lot of people have this kind of thought but if we're gonna think seriously about life extension we have to look into the dark sides we have to consider these grim possibilities and if we're working on this topic right now we have to think about this right now so that's tonight's vlog uh, I hope everybody's well I hope you're safe and sound and I'd love your thoughts in uh, comments or if you'd like to follow up with a video of your own good night